Good evening, everyone. My name is John Ravenhill. I'm the director of the Bolsillie School of International Affairs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the school to this very special event this evening. For those of you who are not familiar with the school, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to say a few words about what we do and who we are. The school was established eight years ago thanks to very generous gifts from Jim Balsillie to our three partner institutions, Wilfrid Laurier University, University of Waterloo, and the Center for International Governance Innovation. And we're very grateful to the center, CG, for allowing us to use the splendid auditorium this evening. The school has three principal missions. First, we engage in cutting edge research. We have about 65 faculty drawn from the two universities involved in a huge number of projects within our six very broadly defined research clusters. And you'll see if you have good glasses on tonight, <laughs> our six research clusters listed there. We host high quality graduate programs at the master's and PhD level in international public policy and global governance on behalf of our two university partners. And the third thing that we do is to run a very large number of events. Last year we had about 120. And most of these are open to the public. So if you haven't already signed up for our newsletter, I invite you to do so. And you can do this through our website, which again will be listed quite frequently, I think, this evening. But enough of the advertisements. Let's move very quickly to the main event. And I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Alan Whiteside, one of my colleagues in the school who is responsible for organizing this very special event and who will be this evening's moderator. Anything goes wrong, it's his problem. <laughs> <laughs> Alan joined the school just over two years ago from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where in 1998 he established the Health, Economics, and HIV AIDS Research Division, of which he was the executive director. He is the CG Chair in Global Health at the School and in the School of International Policy and Governance at Laurier. So please welcome Alan Whiteside. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your moderator this evening. And I want to start with a very short overview of the people who are on the panel and explain what we're going to do. And I know for some of them, this comes as a surprise because they didn't know what we were going to do. Our guest of honor <laughs> is Stephen Lewis. And I don't think he needs a lot of introduction because I think you all know of, of him as an outspoken, morally impeccable champion of social justice. If there was anyone who punched above their weight and continues to do so, it is Stephen Lewis. And I was told I wasn't allowed to give his CV, but we will mention that he was Canada's ambassador to the United Nations. He then went on to be deputy director of UNICEF. He was the UN special envoy uh, for AIDS and HIV in Africa. And in this role, he campaigned tirelessly uh, to bring the unfolding disaster of AIDS to the attention of the world and African leaders. And for us in South Africa, it was an extraordinarily depressing time, as Stephen well knows. Into this maelstrom, Stephen rode on a white charger, a voice of sanity, compassion, when necessary, outrage, and always a friend. And really, Stephen, I think you get thanked about this quite often, but really, thank you for that. Thank you so much for doing that. He established... He established the Stephen Lewis Foundation. He and longtime colleague Paula Donovan founded, uh, co founded AIDS Free World, advocating for more effective global responses to HIV and AIDS. Every week, and you have to watch this, there's a week in review broadcast from AIDS Free World. It's a must watch. It has magnificent phrases like Davos, a self congratulation orgy. 
and my personal favorite, the monarch of Swaziland, an identifiable jerk. <laughs> so Stephen is a magnificent polymath, a man of principle, and I think we're very lucky to have him in Waterloo this evening. So thank you, Stephen. Moving on, the leprechaun at the James Obinsky at the end <laughs> is uh, the professor of health sciences at the Laurier University, professor of medicine at D the Dalai Lama School of Public Health, CG research chair in global health. He's the co-founder of Dignitas International, which conducts research and has more than a quarter of a million people on treatment in Malawi. He's the co-founder of the DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, and he's the former international president of MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, for those who don't speak French like me. <laughs> Alison Blay Palmer is the CG Chair in Sustainable Food Systems at the Balsili School. She leads a network of Canadian and international-based community research projects that work to better understand opportunities and limits to fair, green, healthy, and localized food systems. And I discovered when I lectured her class last night that she actually uh, does what she stands for because she brings dinner in for the students. <laughs> what a remarkable uh, thing to have happen. I, I, I really envy those students, uh, but it's only uh, once a week. You didn't have any of the dinner, Alan. So. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, is Heather Harkness, who's a MIP student who gets to see me twice a week, lucky girl, uh, who came to the school to further her knowledge of international political economy as well as global political public health, and she wants to use her background in economics and business to make evidence-based, internationally effective policies that positively contribute to aspects of human development. Now, the structure of our evening is that each of our panelists will have the opportunity to pose a question to Stephen. He will answer, and we will, subject to time, go on to a second round of questions. At the end of this, we'll open it up to the floor, and this includes people in the overflow room and those watching on the web who will have the opportunity to pose questions to Stephen or to the panel. At the end of the evening, we will invite Sarah Stone uh, rep to represent the Waterloo community and come up on the platform and close the meeting. There will be light refreshments in the foyer, and you are more than welcome to uh, stay and uh, mix and mingle with us. We will be finishing at... Um, 12.30 exactly. I'm a Stakhanovite when it comes to time. <laughs> and not everybody, Stephen, knows who a Stakhanovite is these days, which appalls me. But you told me we could go to an infinite length. Oh. Why are you... All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for coming. As you can see, I think we, you can understand we're going to enjoy this evening. So, let's hand it over and let uh, James start the evening off. Well, first, it is just a great pleasure uh, to be here with uh, my colleagues from the Basili School, and most especially with, with Stephen. Uh, we've had a long uh, friendship and history together and have done many things over the years. And um, now, Stephen, you are slightly older than me. Uh, just thought I'd point that out. Uh, and um, with your vast experience uh, over the last, uh, how many years is it? Many years, let's leave it at that. Uh, with your vast experience politically um, and internationally, uh, you've seen uh, multilateralism uh, go through many uh, phases and iterations, and you've played many roles uh, in that process. Uh, first as UN ambassador, as, as Alan said, then as deputy director of uh, UNICEF, then as UNAID special envoy. Uh, and you continue to play many roles uh, on many uh, significant commissions over the last 15 or so years, um, most notably the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health and uh, another commission on, on uh, uh, um, uh, societal determinants of health. Uh, my question to you, Stephen, is we are now in the second decade of the 21st century. Uh, we are a population of 7.4 billion. Uh, we uh, have massive uh, and, in some cases, overwhelming uh, problems of the global commons, problems like climate change, 
emerging infectious diseases, uh, food insecurity. Um, we also have an ongoing international financial crisis. Uh, started in 2008 and is still ongoing. Uh, we've moved from a uh, bipolar world to, uh, during the Cold War, to a unipolar world. We're now very clearly a multipolar world. The question, Stephen, is what is the role, in your view, uh, of Canada uh, in an international context? And what is the role of Canada in the current multilateral system? Is there a formal role uh, that uh, we can play in a better way uh, than we have played? And are there also informal roles uh, that we could play uh, in a better way that, than, uh, than we have played? Fair enough. Let, let me begin by saying that I'm not merely a little older than you are. I'm in my dotage, and, uh, and you're in adolescence. Uh, so I feel quite comfortable in dealing with this. I also want to say that apart from the hyperbolic excesses to which Alan regularly goes, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to share the platform with everyone. Alan has been, for me, I want all of you to know this, a guru in the realm of HIV and AIDS. There's probably no one on this planet, in my experience, over the last many years, who has such a grip on the nature of that, uh, of that communicable disease, of infectious diseases generally, and the implications, particularly for the African continent. And it's been a joy. I mean, we've both enjoyed it. We've enjoyed a, a constant collaborative spirit on these issues. And I, I frankly feel that, that uh, on the wings of this panel, uh, Alan and James, I wish I knew my women colleagues more closely, but, but I don't. But on the wings of this panel, there is a tremendous knowledge of, of these issues. And uh, I can easily be over-commanded uh, by, uh, by James or by Alan. Now, what I'm about to say is torturing me. Um, and you cannot imagine how distraught I am and how I am containing my natural proclivity to tears. Uh, uh, but I'm going to say something nice about liberals. Uh, 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 well, 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 you may find that comical, but I, I have to face my wife when I return home. Uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is, alas, true that the, that the culture of Canada politically has shifted dramatically and the fossilized Philistines who were in power for a decade, <laughs> the, 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 the pre-Paleolithic Neanderthals who inhabited the precincts of power are, uh, are now, God bless us, out to pasture. Uh, 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 And, and, and I, I, I think we have to give the new occupants uh, the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I was on a, a panel yesterday, yesterday in Ottawa. Uh, actually, it was on HIV and the new technologies around vaccines and microbicides. And during the course of the panel, uh, towards the end, the new Minister of Health came in and spoke, Jane Philpott, and and a young woman, the Member of Parliament from Burlington, who is the Parliamentary Secretary for Global Affairs, really for the Canadian International Development, also spoke. And I was completely stunned because I'd never seen two people of cabinet or proximate cabinet affiliation who made substantial speeches. I mean, for the last decade, cabinet ministers would come in and simply throw out a few artifacts of claptrap and then leave. Uh, and, and, and in this instance, there was uh, intelligence and substance, and it, it, it really encouraged the, the audience. And working from that, I think it's fair to say that Canada's reputation internationally and our work on multilateralism, James, might well be significantly enhanced over the next number of years. And there are so many ways that can be possible. If our voices are heard again at the United Nations, that would be of itself astonishing. I'm in a citadel of enlightenment in this room. Now raise your hands, all of you who know the name of the present Canadian ambassador to the United Nations. Aha. Uh -huh. It's embarrassing, isn't it? And you know what? I don't know his name either. <laughs> uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm ready to admit it. 
Uh, I'm meeting with the new Canadian ambassador on Monday because I suspect his voice will be heard. But, but that's, that's the point. Canada's presence has been negligible in the international community for a decade. And particularly at the fulcrum of that community, where a lot happens, as in the United Nations, we're simply no longer thought of in, a, in serious terms. So if, in fact, uh, the Prime Minister and his colleagues now begin to pursue the briefs that are at hand and make their presence felt, there is, for example, in April, something called a UN General Assembly Special Session on Drugs. And yesterday, the Minister of Health, when I talked to her about it, said to me she was leading the Canadian delegation to the United Nations on that special session. And that special session is a very serious one because it is a, a tremendous battle internationally between the view of injecting drug use and drug use generally as a public health question on the one hand or a question to be punitive and criminalized on the other hand. And we will put, for the first time, a progressive position, which is an elixir, it's very exciting. It may well be that this government will take the cap off foreign aid. That will be an extraordinary contribution to Canada's reputation internationally because much of the developing world is very hostile to us for our refusal to continue to do what we used to do, which is to provide official development assistance in amounts which made a difference to the countries that received the money. We may begin slowly but determinedly uh, to increase our role in peacekeeping, uh, which is now, again, absolutely negligible. And it's very sad that it's negligible because, of course, peacekeeping was created by Lester Pearson many, many years ago during the Suez Crisis, and it would be wonderful to have Canada's presence in that realm restored. There are so many areas. There was a fascinating op-ed in the Globe and Mail a couple of days ago written by Alan Rock, a former ambassador to the United Nations, and Lloyd Axworthy, a former foreign minister, on the Syrian refugees. They were making the point that it's not enough merely to settle Syrian refugees in Canada and show a compassionate, enlightened spirit in that way but also for Canada to do much more to be of assistance in the refugee camps in Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey, and to play a leadership role in those areas as much as we're setting some kind of model for the world in our acceptance of Syrian refugees. Just one thing after another emerges where the voice of Canada again can be appreciated and heard. When I was at the UN, uh, it, it, was, it was a wondrous experience. We were considered an influential middle power, by and large, pretty decent, by and large, pretty generous, by and large, pretty trustworthy. And when we took very strong stands on the vulnerability of the developing world, and when we took very strong stands on apartheid and the end of apartheid in South Africa, it meant something. Canada's voice was treasured and embraced. And it's painful to think what we've lost over the decade. It's painful to think that we ran for the Security Council and it was so mortifying. We were so, uh, so repudiated by the world community that we removed our name from the ballot before the votes could be taken because of the, of the levels of uh, humiliation. All of that can change if our work on climate change is serious and not merely rhetorical if when there is a special session of the United Nations, as there will be in June, on HIV and AIDS, and we make greater financial commitments and understand the pain and anxiety that still exists at community level in Africa as funding is withdrawn, they need a champion internationally to voice what is going on still as the pandemic continues to wreak havoc. If we are that enlightened voice, you cannot imagine the extraordinary plaudits and adoration which will rain upon us as the world heaves a sigh of relief and says, Canada is back in multilateralism again. And that's what I hope happens. So my question is regarding female discrimination. Um, as I'm sure you've observed for yourself, there are many patriarch 
difficult cultures that have ingrained elements of either physical or sexual violence against women, or they see them only as a means to legitimize a man's sense of masculinity. From your own attempts to reach females through the UN Special Envoy for HIV AIDS, your role in uh, founding UN Women, and your further work through the Stephen Lewis Foundation, do you have any insight into how we could best uh, target female discrimination without alienating the overall overarching cultures that this problem exists within? <clears throat> Have we got a, a week or two? <laughs> uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, two, two premises that lie in the question. Um, it, it isn't the alienation or offense of... Uh, of, of large groups uh, to, to deal with the rights of women and the appalling levels of discrimination against women uh, largely means that you've got, to, uh, you've got to deal with and offend men. Um, I'm not crazy about men. Uh, uh, I have, uh, I, I've, I've said before, and I actually think I'm beginning to believe it rather than allowing it to be a rhetorical flourish, that men as a species are largely beyond redemption. Uh, and, I, and, I, I, and I believe that the feminist analysis and the feminist critique is probably the most important vehicle that the international community can embrace in dealing with these questions, particularly of sexual violence. And I think the other, the other thing that is involved here, Heather, is that there can be no um, accommodation for these uh, supposed cultural problems of, of uh, gender. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you cannot allow cultural relativism to continue to impose dreadful and appalling discrimination upon, upon women. It's just not on. There are, there are some human rights that are human rights, and, uh, and the human rights of women are sacrosanct, and we don't negotiate around cultural relativism. That's just, uh, that's just nonsense. And the countries that ask us to do that, whether it's Saudi Arabia on one hand, or Pakistan on the other, or, or for that matter, Honduras or El Salvador, uh, the reality is that you cannot give those countries an inch that you take the stand on gender equality. Uh, I, I think it's worth saying that the struggle for gender equality is the single most important struggle on the planet. There is nothing that comes close to it. You cannot continue to marginalize 50% of the world's population and ever expect to approximate social justice. So when you're dealing with questions... When you're dealing with questions of, of gender equality, there is no compromise, there is no relativism, there is only a very tough stand. I, I have to say uh, that the reality of sexual violence, whether it's intimate partner violence, whether it's marital rape, whether it's gang rape, whether it's rape in conflict in so many countries of the world, that is uh, uh, an excrescence on the body politic which the world has not yet learned to cope with. Uh, and that's because there is so much hypocrisy and resistance around it. And you, you just have to settle your mind on fighting it constantly and dealing with those international agencies which should be playing a very strong role and aren't playing a very strong role. We created UN Women three or four years ago and having created them after a tremendous battle over a few years so that there was a new international agency for women, we're now starving UN women. An outfit like UNICEF has four or five billion dollars a year. UNDP, eight to ten billion dollars a year. UN women, they're working at 350 or 400 million dollars a year. You create an international agency for women and then you shackle it, you absolutely paralyze it by refusing to raise the money to keep it going. We have Security Council resolution after Security Council resolution that peacekeepers should protect women and girls in their particular domains in conflict countries and time and time again the peacekeepers are not there when the sexual violence is, uh, is launched or unleashed and uh, my colleagues and I in AIDS Free World have been working this, these last many months on the uh, shocking 
and disheartening reality of United Nations peacekeepers committing sexual violence against the local population. That seems a nightmare, that you send peacekeepers out to bring peace to conflict and they assault the civil society whom they're supposed to protect. And when you push hard, you find that at the senior levels of the United Nations establishment, there's a kind of conspiratorial design to suppress evidence of sexual violence and sexual assault. And it gets so bad that the Secretary General is forced to appoint a review panel chaired by a former judge of the Canadian Supreme Court, Madam Justice Marie Deschamps, and have her produce a report which calls the UN guilty of gross institutional failure. That's the precise clause. And, and I can't tell you how, how angry one gets at watching the willingness to sustain the constant gender inequality. When the U United Nations Secretary General decided to have an overall review of international peacekeeping, and he does that because it's the most expensive facet of the United Nations. They spend $8.27 billion a year on peacekeeping. And when they ask for an overall review, he appoints 12 men and three women. And he calls it gender equality. Now, the Secretary General is somewhat arithmetically challenged, obviously, <laughs> but, but then when, when we point it out to him, they apologize, and they say they'll correct it, and they appoint three more women. So then it's 11 men and six women, and now they're absolutely certain it's gender equality. <laughs> uh, and then they appoint a panel to oversee funding for climate change. 19 people on the panel, 19 men. I mean, you have to understand what we're dealing with in the international community. So it's gently pointed out to them that there's a, a somewhat of an imbalance uh, when you have 19 men out of 19 appointees. And they go into a froth of anxiety and they find a finance minister in France and a finance minister in Indonesia who are both women and they appoint them and then they give you a broad smile and say, you see, it's 19 to 2, it's obviously equal in the, uh, in the evidence presented. Every step of the way, we, we, we encounter this terribly difficult proclivity to diminish the role and place of women, which ultimately is expressed in rape as a strategy of war. And if you visit, if you visit the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and you go into the eastern region, and you go into the little sub-regional capital of Bukavu, and you go to the Pansy Hospital, and you sit down with Dr. Denis Mukwege, who runs the hospital, a lovely, decent, honorable surgeon with colleague surgeons who spend a significant portion of their time surgically repairing the reproductive tracts of the women who come mutilated to the hospital. Half a million rapes over the last 10 to a dozen years in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and with the largest peacekeeping force in the world, we haven't been able to contain it. And I don't pretend that these are easy issues. They're desperately difficult issues. But there is so little energy that comes from the political establishment to confront it. And that's what's missing. And I, and I, and I, 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 I appreciate the question, but I have, to, I have to admit to you that it is the most appalling, egregious phenomenon on the planet what is happening to the women from Syria who are traversing Europe, to the women in the Central African Republic who are subject to violence, uh, to the women in Somalia, to the young girls who are abducted by Boko Haram in Nigeria, uh, to the women who are assaulted by Al-Shabib in Mogadishu. It is a constant plague, and the inability of the world to deal with it is a commentary frankly, on the fact that men still control the levers of power. And although there is a tremendous renaissance of women activists across the world who are fighting hard on behalf of women and girls and pushing heroically against the tide, by God, it, is, it, is, uh, it leads to rage. I have an emotional range which moves from rage to rage. Uh, <laughs> 
I, 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 I wish it were otherwise. Sorry to have gone on so long, Heather. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Let's ask Alison if she'd like to pose a question. But before we do, I would say that if anybody doesn't look at AIDS Free World and some of these marvelous um, sources of information, I would strongly urge you to do it. I think that you are doing uh, us in Canada and the globe a great service through AIDS Free World. And I hope at some point we'll put up the, uh, the uh, website again. Uh, it is a remarkably useful um, and moving uh, website to visit. And Let's there's an adjacent website called the Code Blue Campaign, which is our campaign to prevent sexual violence committed by United Nations peacekeepers, which is actually a very, very interesting website. Sorry. Good. Thank you. Alison. Thank you. Um, as you well know, um, many communities um, around the world are challenged to provide fair access to healthy, uh, good quality food. Um, as reported by the United Nations in the 2015 uh, State of Food Insecurity Report, um, they uh, estimate that there's 795 million food insecure people in the world. Um, and these challenges, as you also know all too well, are, are particularly acute in um, communities and countries in the global south. And they're intimately connected with issues of gender, poverty, and also with disease. And I was wondering if you could comment, um, first of all, on how those uh, different uh, tensions come together uh, through the lens of HIV AIDS. And also, um, if you can bring into the conversation uh, the tensions that exist between food aid, um, export development agriculture, and the move to relocalize or localize agriculture and food uh, provisioning at the community level. Okay, I am out of my depth. Goodness. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! I can't I, imagine I, that's oh, possible. Oh, no, it is possible. Uh, <laughs> I, I am. I am really out of my depth, and I think it's good that you're that you have such a such a grip on these on these subjects yourself, because on the last question about uh, local agriculture and export, etc., I, I I dare not venture an opinion because I just don't know enough. I learned a long time ago that it's so good to admit you don't know. Uh, <laughs> It, it, uh, it really absolves you of responsibility. <laughs> um, but the other part of it I know a little bit about because it's all tied in with the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, have replaced the Millennium Development Goals, and the Sustainable Goals are to run from 2015 to 2030. And there are 17 goals. There were only eight Millennium Development Goals. There are 169 targets, which greatly exceed the number of targets there were in the previous set of goals. And these Millennium Goals apply not just to the developing world, but to the whole world, which is a marked and dramatic change, an important change. And the overarching goal is the elimination of poverty. And, and uh, everything falls within that. And the new definition of poverty released by the World Bank is you're poor if you're impoverished, you're in extreme poverty if you're living at less than $1.90 a day. And there are roughly a billion people on the planet living at less than $1.90 a day. There are 2 billion people on the planet living at less than $3.10 a day. These are World Bank figures relatively reliable. And, I, and I, I, I must say that when you think of those dimensions of poverty, uh, uh, when, when James said there were 7.4 billion people, I think, on the planet at the moment, and you think that two to three billion of them are living at under three dollars a day, it's, uh, it's excruciating in the implications for life in South Asia and Africa. Those are the two areas in the world, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh on the one hand, uh, much of the sub-Saharan African continent on the other, that are coping, gen, uh, coping excessively with this. On the question of food and hunger, you're quite right. There are about 800 million people who do not have adequate nutrition, and they, and they too are struggling. And the, and the combination of poverty and hunger, it's worth pointing out that 
it isn't really an absence of food as much as it is an absence of the appropriate distribution of the food we have. The magnificent Indian Nobel economist Amartya Sen made that point about India, that it isn't, it isn't that they don't have enough food, it's just that it never gets distributed to the people who are hungry. And that's something that the world could do if the world paid attention to it, but again, the self-centered interest of corporate uh, groups makes it uh, virtually impossible. So you have the poverty on one hand and the extreme hunger on the other, and the phenomenon of disease accentuates all of it. There are six million children under the age of five who die every year of preventable diseases. A million of them die on the first day of birth. Two million of them die within the first week of birth. Three million of them die within the first 28 days. And they die of malnutrition, of pneumonia, of dehydration, of diarrhea. They die of a lack of, of food, uh, even breast milk, and they die because the impoverishment of the community is so acute that the forces to sustain them cannot be rallied. It's, it's heartbreaking. And, and on top of that, of course, you have the phenomenon of HIV and AIDS in a number of countries, which you yourself raised and said, I, I should try to integrate. Uh, and, and of course, the reality of HIV is that it has ransacked entire communities and it has added to the poverty. Poverty creates uh, the circumstances of vulnerability and HIV, and HIV in turn uh, takes the resources of the, of the family and the community and results in, um, in more poverty. It's the women who do the agriculture, and they are at risk, and it's this constant interrelationship of all these aspects which uh, make those societies so vulnerable. But I want to add something uh, which I know you deal with but didn't mention in this case, and that's climate change. Mm. Because climate change <laughs> is going to wreck what little there is. As a matter of fact, right now, in southern Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, this is not much talked about, but you watch what happens two or three months from now, there is an enveloping famine. There is less and less food being produced. The droughts are resulting in agricultural paralysis. There, the usual food that is produced in a country like South Africa, on which Mozambique and Zimbabwe and Malawi and Zambia frequently depend, is not going to be available because the amounts have been reduced dramatically. There is a pending famine coming in southern Africa which is going to traumatize that part of the continent and it is all linked to global warming. And there is already a famine in Ethiopia. Uh, the Africa Union met this last week and uh, even the United States allocated a great deal of money to Ethiopia because there are 11 million people at risk. But that phenomenon is spreading through Eastern Africa and down into the South, and I, I really fear for our compatriots in Southern Africa because they, it's already the part of the world most afflicted by HIV, the part of the world most afflicted by malaria, the part of the world most afflicted by tuberculosis. It has terribly low uh, per capita incomes, terrible poverty, fighting for water, fighting for agriculture, and then along comes climate change and complicates and accentuates all that is most vulnerable in the human condition. For me, the climate change is the phenomenon around which the greatest focus of research and work should be, uh, should be given. It's, uh, you, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I was gonna say I'm optimistic by nature, but I'm not. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fatalistic pessimist with a, with a sense of pragmatic doom at every turn. Uh, 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 and, and, and that's the most positive thing I think I've said about the subject. Of, uh, uh, but what we have done, if I can just make the point, we have discharged so much carbon into the atmosphere so thoughtlessly that there is now no preventing what's going to happen between 2030 and 2050. And there's going to be some apocalyptic event. There are going to be some 
catastrophes along the way internationally, which will unleash, by the way, millions of environmental refugees. We haven't even begun to deal with the environmental refugees from Bangladesh and low-lying coastal areas and South uh, Pacific and islands in the Caribbean. All of that is looming. What we do now can change the patterns after 2050. But between now and 2050, the die is largely cast. Uh, incredibly enough, since 1990, the levels of carbon have already gone up by 50%. That is to say, despite Kyoto and every other protestation, despite the promises that were made in Paris just a few weeks ago, we can't contain what we've done. It's out there. It's happening. And therefore, what we do now can change everything in the last half of the century. But for the next 35 years, it's going to be pretty difficult. There'll be a lot of catastrophic moments. And all of that will hit most strongly where people are food insecure. And the food insecurity, it must be a fascinating field to, to study. And, and, and I, honestly, I just have never spent enough time thinking about it. But I, I have to say that the food insecurity is going to be um, desperate mm -hmm. as this evolves. That's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to paint rose-colored glasses pictures here. I, 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 don't, I don't want you to feel that I'm depressed. Uh, so, uh, why are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can't stand it, Alan. <laughs> the uh, Kool-Aid has Prozac in it. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> so uh, some years ago, I shared a platform uh, uh, with David King, the, uh, chief government scientist in the UK, I was talking on AIDS and he was talking on climate change. We hadn't met beforehand and we gave, gave our presentations and afterwards decided that we ought to go into um, business as two of the horsemen of the apocalypse and I wonder if you'd like to join us <laughs> and we might be able to... You know, you're not galloping fast enough. <laughs> That's, that's, but, but in fact, it, it, that is, it, it, is, it is interesting. I mean, you know, what I said about Canada, I believe, and I know that there is reason to be optimistic. And, and James was telling me before we sat down tonight, he, he was talking about the remarkable university research projects that are taking place in Canada and, and the extraordinary contribution we could make to, to uh, research into a variety of infectious diseases that could transform life for people. And, and, and I believe in all of that, and will fight to my dying day in, for all of that. But, but I also have to recognize that the world is, is, is really stalemated at the moment, that the, that the Security Council with those five permanent members with their veto powers can never resolve something like Syria. And, 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 and it's, it's more and more difficult to make, uh, to make progress. Uh, so I'm constantly, I, I, I hate like hell coming to an evening like this. I mean, there's no reason in the world why you should be sitting here and we change places. But I, I, I don't like coming to an evening like this and disgorging views that are fundamentally uh, unpleasant. But they are. Uh, and I apologize to you all for voicing uh, pessimistic uh, feelings about this world. I have them. I can't escape them. Um, but I'm in much better mood now than I used to be. Uh, 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 no, after October 19th, I really felt a lot, 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 a lot better. You know, and, and by the way, uh, just take a look at the United States. Uh, I, 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 no, no, well, I mean, they still pretend to be a significant power, and they've got at least three crypto-fascists running for president on the, on the Republican side. Uh, that, that's a pretty ugly phenomenon. Uh, the only saving grace is a democratic socialist on the, on the democratic side. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous to... Okay, let's maybe uh, put a question to the youngest member of our panel. Uh, Heather, you've, you've, you've heard us uh, um, talking and... Uh, as a, as a student in Waterloo in, in, this, in this program, where do you see optimism? What makes you get, get up in the morning other than the 8.30 lecture with James? <laughs> you don't have an 8.30 lecture with James. 9.30, almost. That, <laughs> that in itself is a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps it interesting, though. I would say 
in the individuals that I go to school with, in the people I talk to, uh, the community feeling. I think things are changing to a certain extent. People are realizing um, what is going on in the world today and trying to make a substantial and positive change. It could be very much the case, like you said, we're not galloping fast enough, but I think the will is there, and I think the power resides in individuals to recognize and hopefully cap, uh, capitalize on this, their ability to make change. Yes, that's a lovely way of putting it. And, and in truth, that is the source of optimism. One source of optimism is the tremendous strength and resilience at the grassroots of communities all across the developing world, particularly amongst the women. The generosity of spirit, the basic decency, the camaraderie, the willingness of community groups to help each other, it's just astonishing to see. I don't know all that much about other parts of the world, but I have seen it in Africa. It is, it is uh, exhilarating to see the resilience, the courage, the determination of people at community level. You're completely right. But the other thing that's exhilarating, which all of you can talk to, is, is the, today's students, the, the determination to, to change the world. Uh, I've, I've been teaching at McMaster, at McGill, and at Ryerson. I teach now at Ryerson. And I'm, I love it because all the classes simply want to get university over with and go out and improve the human condition. There's this, there's this deep and intense wish to design a better world. I, I love that. Uh, and, and that may be the answer. You may be entirely right. Uh, instead of creating hardy little capitalists, we are, uh, well, we're creating human beings. Uh, 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 and, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm inclined to think that that's a good thing. <laughs> well, I, I have to agree with you. I think uh, I'm, I'm very relatively new to this uh, uh, town, and uh, I must admit it's, it's quite remarkable to be able to stride down the sidewalk in February as opposed to teeter down it uh, wearing snowshoes, so it's, it's been an interesting uh, time. Um, this is a remarkable town, uh, and, and I hope we will be able to in inveigle you to come back uh, with some remarkable things going on here, um, from meal delivery services through to RIM, through to all sorts of things, and I, 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 I'm made optimistic by it. James, on the other hand, lives in Guelph, which is deeply depressing. Um, <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, James, if you'd like to comment on anything you've heard or pose any, uh, an additional question. Well, I think I would say that, that um, you know, Stephen's emphasis on climate change is absolutely right. Uh, when you look at, in my I work, I have ongoing research uh, in uh, Malawi, uh, and Stephen uh, knows it well. Uh, it's focused on HIV, health systems, uh, and, uh, and now tuberculosis and primary health care as a delivery mechanism. And what, what's been front and center in my mind now for at least four years um, is my observation when I'm in Malawi, my very clear, vivid image of uh, falling crops, failing uh, crops and failing crop yields, and a very clear, vivid image on a practically a daily basis when I'm in hospital or clinic uh, of uh, children, and most especially girls, uh, who are severely growth stunted mm. uh, because of chronic deprivation of, uh, uh, of basic nutrients for their sustenance, uh, and who, by the way, as girls, um, represent uh, um, uh, the marker of that systemic patriar uh, patriarchal uh, uh, system that you spoke so eloquently about uh, a few moments ago. Uh, their vulnerability uh, in terms of food security um, is, in my mind, the best marker, first of all, of that system. And secondly, uh, it's a, a profoundly uh, arresting marker of the impact of climate change. Mm. And so what, we're, what we see in Malawi uh, is uh, a, a much greater incidence of malnutrition, a much greater incidence of growth stunting, a much greater inst incidence of acute malnutrition, protein energy malnutrition, in the HIV patients that are coming to hospitals and clinics uh, where, where, where we work. 
And so what, what has become a, 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 a not just a preoccupation, and my fellow uh, faculty members know this uh, about me, I've been almost obsessed uh, with uh, climate change uh, and with uh, trying to uh, design health-oriented, community-based, early warning systems um, that respond to climate change and respond to extreme weather events like uh, uh, drought uh, and flood. And flood is one of the other markers of drought. You get, uh, while you have extended periods of intense heat and, and, and a shortened uh, or diminished precipitation, you often have uh, short and more intense periods of, pre of uh, precipitation which lead to flooding. And in uh, not just Malawi, but in the entire region of, of, of uh, Southern Africa, uh, one sees both drought and flood. And so my preoccupation has been, how do we take uh, systems like those created for HIV, like Dignitas and like uh, systems that have been created through ministries of health uh, across Africa and across uh, Southeast Asia, how do we take those systems and adapt those systems so that uh, communities are able to be more, more uh, resilient in the face of, you're absolutely right, uh, not just the coming uh, crises, but the current crises that are going to accelerate uh, over the next uh, 20 years or so. So that's been a, a, an abiding preoccupation for me. And one of the things that I do find quite gratifying is that um, uh, at least among two main groups, one are researchers uh, at major research centers around the world, um, there's a very clear recognition that this is a problem. Uh, and that uh, this is an acute, urgent problem that requires acute and urgent attention. And so with that is coming an increased uh, uh, um, uh, pool of, of funds uh, to support that kind of research. Um, that's my first sort of source, if you will, of, of uh, inspiration, is that there is something happening there. It's slow, it should be a lot faster, but it is going to happen. Uh, funding agencies are very much aware of this. Uh, and in the coming, I would say, 24 months, we will see massive changes uh, in terms of the uh, availability of resources. The other uh, is, you're exactly right, uh, um, among students. Um, students are far more uh, engaged and aware of these issues uh, than, than most other members of, of, of uh, society. Uh, and their, their enthusiasm, um, it's not just sort of ethereal. It's not just sort of academic. It's deeply pragmatic. And that specifically uh, is what I find most inspiring. You know, I just, I just want to say on, on, on James's behalf that the organization he has created, Dignitas, uh, he was saying, and I, I know this anyway from other sources, has 270,000 people in treatment in Malawi. That means they're keeping 270,000 people alive and, and, and extending that reach so there is a tremendous amount of information that Dignitas brings to the table around prevention and treatment and community-based responses. And there are other organizations who, who uh, uh, do, do the same thing. I mean, there are, uh, there are groups of grandmothers in this audience. I'm acknowledging the grandmothers now so that I can escape alive. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, and they, are, they, are in this, they are in this audience uh, who are affiliated with uh, the Stephen Lewis Foundation. I'm embarrassed that it bears my name. I, 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 really, I really was anxious and resisted that at the beginning. So you know what I did? I phoned David Suzuki. <laughs> and I said, David, what do I do? And he, he started to laugh. He said, Stephen, it worked for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, the, but the foundation, through so much of the grandmother's work, also uh, works at community level. And you learn that that's where the great strength lies. And then there are organizations like Partners in Health, which have very strong community-based uh, activity, and it, and, it, and it works. But I, that, 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 I mean, when, when James talks about drawing the lessons of Malawi, he, he, he really knows what, what exists at the grassroots, and that is all the difference in the world. I mean, it, it's, it's what we're trying to, to learn. But you know, again, getting some of the internationalists involved in this is, uh, is, is very, well, it's, it's just very difficult. And the World Health Organization, sometimes even an outfit like UNICEF, they don't, they don't perform as you would want them to perform. 
and the world is sort of held to ransom for a while until they get their act together. See how quickly the World Health Organization worked now on the Zika virus? That's because of the failure on Ebola. Uh, they had to redeem their reputation. They leaped into an emergency call on the Zika virus because they hoped to say to the world, aha, we're not going to delay anymore. We're going to take our role seriously. These, these are very important moments in the, in the life of, a, of an international community. Just this footnote about HIV. The greatest vulnerability for HIV has always been women and girls, always. We've known that for more than 30 years of the virus. We've never got our act together to work as determinedly as is possible to protect the lives of women and girls. It's just unbelievable. Over 60% of people living with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa are women. And the new infections in the age range of 15 to 19 amongst girls are sometimes three to eight times, I think you said eight at one point, Alan, when we talked at Ryerson, they can be, uh, it can be eight times higher than boys of the same age. You see, there's no sexual autonomy. There's no negotiation of safe sex. There's a lot of child marriage. There's the extraordinary susceptibility to infection. The highest death rates on the African continent from HIV are in the age range 15 to 24 amongst young women and girls. And despite all of our knowledge about this, and we've known it for years, and we've hammered it home from the outside, from civil society, it wasn't until last fall that UNICEF and UNAIDS decided to do something special about adolescent girls and HIV, and they launched a program called All In. And they started to devote money and work on preventing transmission amongst women and girls at a young age. But it's 30 years later. See how long these struggles go as you try to get them to deal sensibly with the issues. It's, it's, it's a tough slog. Um, maybe we could get a show of hands from the grandmothers in the audience, please. Fantastic. So nice that you've made it. And let Why are you applauding? <laughs> You're just encouraging them. <laughs> <laughs> Could I ask you, you've certainly had vast experience um, with civil society, both in Africa and I would venture to say also here in Canada, both politically uh, and most recently um, since the founding of the foundation, uh, with, uh, uh, or through the foundation with, with, with the, the, the grandmothers. You also have um, a very particular, very rich understanding of Canadian society. You're, you're, you travel a lot uh, to various parts of the country. Where do you see the strengths of Canadian civil society? Um, both obvious, and I think more importantly, um, subsurface that need to be cultivated, that need to be kind of nurtured so that we can achieve the kind of things that, that, that uh, are near and dear to your heart and to the hearts of those uh, here on the, on the dais. I, I know you will agree with this, but there was, uh, I mean, civil society went through quite a, uh, a trough of, of, uh, of, of despair in the decade, in the last decade because there was no encouragement, there was no money, there was no direction, there was no political inclusiveness. It was just rejection. And so civil society, I think, felt uh, to some extent both constrained and lacerated by the absence of any interest in the political elite of the country. I mean, it was really a sad time, apart from the fact that they were being audited uh, whenever they disagreed with the Tories. So it was a, it was a particularly sad time. I, I think that we now see in the environmental movement, in civil society and the environmental movement, around the pipelines, around Aboriginal land, around, uh, around the whole question of climate, we see civil society playing an extraordinary role. 
I mean, they really are dictating the terms of, of engagement and persuading governments to move. And indeed, civil society on the environment in Canada was very present in Paris during the climate change discussions and negotiations. So that's one area of civil society which is, I think, extremely strong. I was really tickled yesterday in Ottawa to see the, the thing was, was sponsored by ICAD, the International Community of AIDS and Development in, in Africa. But there were, there were a dozen different international development groups that suddenly came together feeling, by God, there is some solidarity, we can make a difference. And they had politicians who actually listened to them. Quietly, not, not exactly secretly, but, but, but calmly, the government is extending olive branches to civil society that has been abjured before now. So Oxfam, Save the Children, CARE, uh, all of those groups that felt in large measure neutered over the last number of years, they are being encouraged to come to the fore again. And I think we will start getting much greater discussions about poverty and child poverty in particular. I see that as a strong civil society. The part that worries me most is the Aboriginal community, is Indigenous peoples. I mean, if ever there is an opportunity for a government to transform the nature of Canadian society, it's to deal honorably for the first time ever with Aboriginal peoples in Canada. That's what makes a difference. And, and, uh, and, and I, 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 get, I get the sense that there's a, a lot of, uh, a lot of activity on, in that regard. Uh, I, I happened also yesterday to, to sit down with one of my heroes, uh, Maud Barlow, in, um, in Ottawa. And, and Maud and the Council of Canadians are doing phenomenal civil society work on water, on health care, on uh, a different form of uh, voting and on um, justice for Indigenous persons. And I, I was thinking as I was chatting with Maud that, that this is another example. She's got 65 chapters across Canada. They're all engaged and they're all pressing. So I have a feeling that civil society is stirring again. It's, I, I just, you know, why, why isn't there an international criminal court for defeated conservative politicians? I, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't understand why it has to be just African leaders. I, I mean, I have a whole list at home on the, on the fridge. Uh, it's a very long list of, uh, of people who deserve to spend, along with George Bush and Tony Blair, who deserve to spend a good deal of time behind bars, but that's a, that's a personal feeling. Sorry, Alan. I, I'm out of control and I don't care. <laughs> I think let's bring um, Alison into the, uh, apparently you are being controlled. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is I have, uh, I have hearing aids and they are making it somewhat difficult to fix this. Whilst we're waiting for that to be fixed, Alison, you, uh, rather than uh, have you ask a question, uh, let's, let's give you a chance to say something uh, about the things that you saw as really important uh, to raise the SDGs and um, the Grandmother's Foundation and the importance of building resilience. How, how do you see this playing out at the moment? I mean, uh, you, you wanted to raise this, but why, why do you feel this is so important? Well, it, it would be to um, build on what Heather and Stephen said um, about the importance of grassroots initiatives, really. And I think that um, we've seen over the course of the last few decades that really a lot of the substantial change has come from the community mm. level and has really been leading um, and showing the way forward uh, in many important areas, including climate change, um, but also in terms of developing access to uh, good quality, healthy food for communities um, and providing within some First Nations communities as well um, ways forward. So I think that they provide, um, they provide the foundation in some ways. And I think that by connecting, and that's what I'm, I was going to ask you about your grandmother's initiative, because I think it's really inspirational. And I think it, um, 
it, it does that. It connects communities here with communities in Africa. And I think that that opportunity for solidarity, but also for um, support is, is critical. And I think that that's really um, one of the important ways forward. But also at the same time, um, we need to have those multi-level governance pieces in place because we need systems change and we we have to be able to make that happen somehow so you, you're you're entirely i love the solidarity between the canadian grandmothers and the african grandmothers you you, you won't uh, people in the audience won't know this but it, it's really quite phenomenal since 2000 since july of 2006 until today the canadian grandmothers have raised $24 million for the grandmothers of Africa. Is that not astounding? I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's just, it, it's phenomenal, and it has all gone, gone to the grassroots uh, grannies in Africa, and frequently African grandmothers will come to Canada and tour the country, and Canadian grandmothers will go to Africa. I was in Uganda, what, three months ago? I was in Uganda three months ago at a grandmother's gathering. 500 grandmothers from all over Uganda for three days of intense discussion. And they didn't focus. And it was all done, we, we were just there to support them. It was, it was all designed and orchestrated and conducted by the grandmothers themselves. They had their own interpreters. There were several languages, 500. And, and the politicians who came at the end of the meeting described it as a political revolution. They got a little nervous about it because they, <laughs> they, they saw a kind of mass movement. And these grandmothers weren't talking about food, clothing, and shelter. They were talking about human rights. The, the whole discussion has moved forward. So now it's the right to land, it's the right to inheritance, it's the right to freedom from sexual violence, it's the right to health, the right to education, the right to food for their orphan kids. I mean, it's, it's just phenomenal how the grandmothers of Africa uh, take hold when they can. The most delicious parts of all the conversations were the right to sexuality. I mean, they got very indignant uh, when it was suggested that they weren't sexually active because they were grandmothers. And they made very, very vigorous speeches about the joys of sex. And, 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 and you could see a, a kind of liberation in the feeling that they had real strength and focus. And for that's what I mean about, well, that, that's what you mean when you say resilience. I mean, it's this phenomenal energy and intelligence that comes to the fore if you ever give it a chance. There's so much we can learn from... from uh, and now the International AIDS Conference this year is in Durban in July. And on the eve of the conference, we are having a grandmother's gathering and we're having a grandmother's march and we're going to make demands of the conference, and we anticipate 2,000 grandmothers in Durban uh, putting pressure on the International AIDS Conference to, to exhibit a greater sensitivity towards the, towards the pandemic and older women. So, it's, yeah, there's a, there, there's, there's a lot about it which is, which is good. I had absolutely... Uh, it, it's the foundation, in fact, it, it's uh, uh, our older daughter, Ilana, who runs the foundation, who actually thought up the idea of the grandmothers. The foundation quickly embraced it. I then became, as I love being, a sort of addendum, you know, an adjacent irrelevance that comes in from time to time and makes speeches. Um, uh, but but it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendous thing that they've done as I watch it from, from the outside. It's meant a lot. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a phenomenon now. It's a mass movement. And internationally, the AIDS movement respects it, uh, these grandmothers. I mean, do you know there are 17 million orphans in sub-Saharan Africa, one or both of whose parents have died of AIDS? And they say one or both because if it's the mother who's died, frequently is, then effectively the child feels orphaned even if there is one family member. So the definition accepted internationally is one or both parents. 17 million kids, and the great majority of them, about 60% of them, being looked after by grandmothers. I mean, this is, they're, they're holding whole societies together. So this is really a fascinating phenomenon. Right, well, we need to uh, move this on, and I'd like to invite questions from the floor. There are microphones there, so if anyone has a question, please would you make your way up to the microphone, 
and be prepared to make you, uh, pose your question. And I would stress, pose a question. It's not a statement or a speech, it's a question. So let's see if there's anyone I haven't put off by saying that. Any questions from anyone? Whilst, whilst, yeah, okay, I see someone going down. Stephen, I'm doing some work in Swaziland, um, which uh, has involved looking at the M Ministry of Education records. And uh, there are 240,000 kids in primary school in Swaziland, of whom 60,000 are orphaned or vulnerable children. That is unbelievable. I was shocked, rigid, when I looked at the data. That's the bad news, but there is good news. Those kids are in school, which yes. is amazing. And yes. thanks to our friend Derek von Wissel, they're getting one meal a day, which is fantastic. Yeah, it is. And I can remember visiting a little elementary school in Swaziland, and you know, when you have a visitor, all the students are brought out of the school and they array themselves on the, on the, on the grassy knoll outside. Uh, and there were 350 kids in tattered uniforms, uh, looking very eager but uh, bewildered. And I was going to say something to them, and I remember the, the uh, principal of the little school taking the microphone, we had a microphone, and she said, uh, Mr. Lewis, before you speak to these kids, these 350 children, I want you to know that 260 of them are orphans. And you, you think to yourself, the accidents of birth in this world, eh? And what they do to children. This is to whoever uh, on the panel wants to offer insight towards it. Um, but there's, uh, you know, as, as you've all touched on, there's so many of these, these massive um, and crippling issues that are facing the world today, famine, HIV and AIDS, climate change, et cetera, of which you've, you've touched very briefly on. They're very complex issues with very um, large numbers of moving parts within them. But um, there's also a very large number of organizations worldwide fighting each and every single one of them, whether it's many organizations working towards a cure for AIDS, et cetera. Um, do you think uh, that in some way that collaboration more openly and more frequently of these organizations um, would help to further the progress on uh, the solution, if you will, to these issues? Thank you. Um, James, have a crack at that, please. Well, I think <laughs> well, it's actually a, a very nicely formulated question um, that it gets to one of the fundamental issues that this space that we're in uh, is about, which is governance. Mm. Um, there's a complexity of issues and there's a complexity of uh, interested and engaged partners or, or actors. And one of the great challenges that we face now in the second decade of the 21st century is the nature of that complexity and trying to uh, infuse it uh, with effective governance uh, so that we are able to make effective decisions that deal with real world problems. So I think the, 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 the way you've illuminated the, quest, the, the issue is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, the, my answer comes in the form of a question which I'm actually going to pose to Stephen. Um, <laughs> I, my f strong feeling is that um, the, 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 the answer lies in leadership. Uh, now, that is, can be either formal, uh, and formally we've we historically, uh, uh, and even in a significant way in contemporary <laughs> terms, we have given that leadership, or that leadership takes form uh, in our politicians, in our, in our uh, governments. Uh, that has been effective, um, to a point, uh, but really since you know, mid 20th century, post-World War II, that effectiveness has been waning and diminishing uh, as our global problems have become even more complex. We also have seen the rise of civil society, transnational civil society. We've also seen the rise of uh, multinational uh, business uh, as a very significant power. Uh, so my question to you really is about leadership within each of those domains and how do we uh, encourage both formal leadership and informal leadership in a way that is actually legitimate uh, for our uh, contemporary problems. So when you were going to ask me whether I felt that leadership was the issue and I was going to say yes <laughs> <laughs> and, and show you that brevity is an art. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think the political leadership is waning. Um, although, 
we are still nation states. We haven't been able to create an international society which doesn't pay as much attention to sovereign borders. We occasionally do that uh, when it's out of control, like a Syria or a Libya or an Iraq or an Afghanistan. But on balance, the sovereignty of individual nation states is sacrosanct, and therefore the leaders within that nation state really take hold. Now, maybe we could choose our leaders differently. Maybe we could have a different voting system in Canada, uh, where, where the, the, the first past the post wasn't the measure of, uh, of electing leaders. But, but I, I don't know how you do the political stuff um, unless you get a greater and greater engaged citizenry. I thought it was really uh, extraordinarily encouraging to see the numbers of young people who came out to support Bernie Sanders in Iowa, and, and I think getting young people involved has been so elusive and so difficult that that would be wonderful. Now, how you do it within multinational corporations, I, I have absolutely no idea, nor do I want to have uh, any... Uh, uh, idea. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's fair to say that, well, just take a look at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, th this was, it was, as you said, uh, I'll, I'll quote you, an orgy of triumphalism. Uh, and they all got together, all these uh, magnificent uh, uh, paratroopers who had uh, the, the multinational corporations, and they spent a week, uh, they spent a week complimenting each other and what a wonderful job they were doing for the world. And, of course, they have created all the problems in the world, so it seems a bit much. And, and you know, they, they, they pull in the civil society. I mean, now, now it's, a, now it's a, a measure to be invited to the World Economic Forum. They invite Oxfam, they invite certain environmentalists. Uh, by the way, I, I have not been invited to the World uh, Economic <laughs> Forum. Uh, uh, well, I, 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 it bothers me because it, it, it feels discriminatory. Uh, I, I, um, but I, I, I must say that when I watch the behemoth of multinationals gathered at Davos uh, with so little understanding of the struggles of communities at the grassroots across the world, such a celebration of the return of the banks and the hedge funds, and it's, it's very disturbing. So I have no idea how to change the multinationals, although people will tell me that they have corporate social responsibility and many of the leaders are really great and they worry and they don't sleep at night because of the agony of humankind. Um, civil society? I think civil society is beginning to develop stronger and stronger leaders. I think they are coming from within. They're coming from the bottom up. They really, their voices are being heard. I, I think civil society is really changing this world. Uh, you know, uh, when Ban Ki-moon said he and the UN were responsible for the Paris conference, I had to laugh, because there would have been no Paris conference without civil society. That, that, that's what did it around the world. The people, the, the civil society who put pressure on their governments and forced them to go to Paris and, and, and take it seriously. And ultimately, they didn't take it seriously. Everybody talks about this monumental triumph. The truth is about Paris, number one, that if you put together all of the promises and undertakings of all of the governments in the world, you wouldn't come close to keeping the temperature of the planet at a level which would save the planet down the road. And the second thing is there wasn't a single binding measure in the entire Paris conference. None of the undertakings are, are binding, are mandatory. They're all voluntary. So whether or not governments produce answers is anybody's guess. We're still toying with global warming. We're still toying with the life of the planet. But the way it's beginning to change is civil society. So, James, I like, I like the prospects for, for civil society. God, I become a curmudgeon. Yeah. Mm. Let's move over. Uh, hi, I'm Joel Blitt. I'm a professor uh, in Waterloo. Uh, I'm also affiliated with CG. Uh, so, Stephen, I have a question for you. We, the discussion hasn't been pessimistic enough, so I thought I'd throw another challenge uh, that we're facing, and it's the one that keeps me up at night. Um, I think increasing inequality is one of the biggest challenges that we're going to be facing sort of going forward, and, and it's expressing itself in different ways in different countries. Sometimes it's uh, unemployment for youth, sometimes it's underemployment, sometimes it's just literally the wages being very different. Um, I personally, I think 
this is occurring partly because of globalization, partly because of technology, robotics, machine learning, everything else that you can throw in there. Uh, it's probably going to get worse in the near term. I was just wondering if this is something that you worry about and where would you would rank this relative to your hundreds of other concerns. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's take a couple of other uh, comments and questions and then we'll go back to the panel. Uh, Ma'am? I think I'm a little bit... Can you hear this? Okay, good. I'm a member of Oma Siskona, the Grandmothers Together, so, and it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. But in being a member of Oma Siskona, I have um, had the opportunity of meeting some of the wonderful grandmothers that have come over from the Sub-Saharan Africa, and they come with such joy, and they come with such hope, and they have taught us so many amazing ways of being resilient. I think my question is, is do you, do you hold out any hope for the fact that the generations that they are raising, the young children they are raising, they are raising to be more equal and that this will perhaps have a, a, a huge change on the culture so that women become, are, are seen more, more equitably? Okay. Because this is the job that the grandmothers are raising these young babies and, it, you, and we all know to change a culture, it has to start in infancy and it has to grow with the child. So these boys need to be, these young men need to be educated and nurtured. And I just have, I feel hopeful that that's going to happen through the grandmothers raising the, these orphans, their orphan grandchildren. Let's How do take, you feel? Let's take one last comment and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, I guess this is, well, this would be for anybody who wants to, to address it, but obviously for our, our keynote today. Um, I work with the Academic Council on the UN System Acorns here at the Bolsilly School. Uh, and the last three weeks or so, I've been in, in Vienna, in New York, and in Geneva, talking to a lot of uh, ambassadors and others in different events. And there's a lot of excitement and interest that Canada is back. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that uh, we thought about trying to get under the Security Council and then understanding that we were going to fail, uh, backed out of that, that effort. Do you think um, the guy you're going to be talking to is, is Mark andre Blanchard, the new ambassador. Do you think you would go down there and say the council is something that Canada should be looking at uh, running to be on in five years' time or something like that? And if so, what would you say the top three or four things that he should be looking at to make an impact uh, for Canada in, in the UN, in New York, and elsewhere over the next 100 days to start getting us back on the map there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one from the uh, web, because there are people out there watching on the internet. Uh, during times of conflict, do you feel that HIV initiatives are neglected uh, in the response process? Should they be paid better attention? During times of conflict, do you feel, H feel like HIV in initiatives are neglected in the response process and should they be paid better attention? And thank you for the many, many web questions. We have very limited time. So let's go to the panel. Perhaps let, me you, jump to the, uh, let me jump uh, to Let me say I'm, 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 I'm glad you're moving away from my natural ingrained optimism to something which is fairly uh, pessimistic, and that's inequality. Can I make this point? Um, for the first time ever, Inequality is on the international agenda as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. It was not part of the Millennium Development Goals. So there's a recognition that the question of inequality is front and center now. And, and it's worth noting that Oxfam puts out an annual appraisal of inequality, and the most recent appraisal showed that the 62, the 62 wealthiest people on the planet have a wealth equivalent to the entire bottom half of the world's population. That is to say, 62 people have wealth equivalent to three and a half billion people. So the extent of the inequality and the disparity is so pronounced and so grave that it is finally capturing the attention of the world. And the Occupy movement, 
and the ability to talk about the 1% and the 99%, that's, that's, really, uh, that's really important, and it has been put on the map, and that's what Bernie Sanders is talking about and has a lot of people respond to. So the answer to your question is that inequality within societies and among and between societies is terribly serious. It is, a, it is an issue which is on the international agenda. There is a growing sense that inequality, particularly within countries, is, is wrecking those countries, just causing greater and greater poverty and greater and greater job dislocation and greater and greater levels of resentment and anger and that, uh, and that the questions of inequality must be dealt with. It's focused largely on dollars, it's fo focused largely on, on financial matters, but inequality, meaning sort of double standards of the way people are treated, inequality and gender, all of these things are coming together. It's quite fascinating. And the fact that it should be one of the Millennium Development Goals is unprecedented. And number two, the, I, the question about the grandmothers. Yes, the grandmothers, I think, have a devotion to their orphan grandchildren, and sometimes their neighbors and community grandchildren, um, that is really touching and, and encouraging. And it may well be that they will add a dimension of hope to the societies that isn't there now. The, the one thing that is a bit of a concern is that we don't know what's going to happen to so many societies when you've lost an entire generation. And it's very hard to, Alan's done a lot of work in this field and I'm, I'm in a sense borrowing from him, but, but, you, but you don't know down the road, 20, 30, 40, 50 years hence, what happens when you have effectively eviscerated the social and economic and cultural fabric of a society by removing an entire generation, by leaving millions of people at risk and, and, and still have 20 million people who require treatment to stay alive. So the, the complex around HIV is still unfolding. The people who talk casually about ending the pandemic by 2030 forget that when 2030 come, it's estimated, UNAIDS estimates, that there'll still be 200,000 to 500,000 new infections every year, even by 2030. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have a, a microbicide. Uh, we do have antiretroviral dr lugs, w drugs which lower the viral load in the body to undetectable levels so that if you have unprotected sex, you don't transmit the virus. But there are problems of adherence, problems of resistance, problems of opportunistic, inf opportunistic infections which occur. It's, it's still a struggle. And what happens to those orphans is not entirely clear. So, uh, and the grandmothers, you know, they're not in their 40s and 50s. They're much older, many of them. And they won't be around through the lives of those orphan kids. And if those orphan kids haven't got the kind of emotional and therapeutic support which they require, what happens down the road? These are societies whose, whose organic evolution is not yet clear. They're still struggling. And I'll take, do the third question and then leave the, leave the final one, um, the, the business of the UN. We will ask to be on the Security Council <laughs> at the end of this decade. That's the way it works. You try to be on once a decade. That was the first time we were defeated. We've been on every decade since 1945. We just lost last time. But you've got to give it up because, because we're part of something called WEOG. Isn't that a mellifluous uh, acronym? It's Western Europe and Others Group. And we're part of the Others. Uh, we're also part of the CANS, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Uh, and, and the governments within WEOG, uh, they negotiate who will stand for the Security Council at any given moment. So I suspect we'll stand for the Security Council again in uh, 2019, 2020. And it won't be difficult. I can predict now we will be elected in a windstorm of support. Uh, and why? It's it just so easy. If we talk more honestly about human rights, if we have legitimate policies on climate, if we understand that we cannot be subservient to, be, to Netanyahu and Israeli policy, but that there is some middle ground that has to be found, in the, in the Middle East uh, crisis, uh, if, uh, 
if we note that we're going to give greater levels of foreign aid than we've been giving, uh, you, you just can't imagine the way Canada will rise to the surface. So I, I have no worries at all about us getting back on the Security Council, and I think we should get on the Security Council. By the way, there's tremendous pressure to reform the Security Council. There are all kinds of countries, India, Brazil, Nigeria, South Africa, Pakistan, many countries that feel they should be on the Security Council with at least a partial veto. There's tremendous resentment growing that you've got five countries which came out of the ashes of the Second World War, three of them Western countries, France, the UK, and the United States. Why should they have a veto on everything that comes before them when the Second World War ended in 1945? What kind of sense is that? So there's great pressure. By the way, there is also great pressure on electing a woman as the Secretary General of the United Nations. There's never been a woman Secretary General. There's a very considerable pressure to find uh, a, a woman who could be a successful candidate. It's interesting. Um, the people who support women candidates are inclined to say, let's find a woman of tremendous intelligence and great charisma and immense leadership capacities to be Secretary General. And the women's movement said, we never ask that of the men. <laughs> uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of the evening. Um, and I do, uh, I have to invite uh, someone up to give the vote of thanks. Uh, but before I do that, I do personally want to say a big thank you uh, to the people up on the panel, particularly to you, Stephen, and also I uh, thanks, and I don't know how often she gets it, uh, to Christina and Josh, uh, because we know that they're your wing people and they ensure that things Win. happen. So thank you very much for making this happen this evening, and she's blushing beautifully, so that's uh, <laughs> no, an achievement. No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> so, with that, let me invite uh, Sarah Stone, a good friend of uh, mine, who uh, uh, is embedded in the Waterloo community to end the evening. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks everyone for being here for this amazing evening. And don't leave, we have light refreshments in the lobby. We'd love for you to stay. Some of our panel will be mingling uh, in the lobby. And on behalf of the Balsilli School and the 2030 Plus group and the Waterloo Region community, please join me in thanking Stephen Lewis for being with us this evening. Yes. I, I, I love being here with Alan and Heather and Allison and James, and I really, really, really appreciate the, the evening. I, I have uh, just a parting thought that I want to share with all of you because it, it doesn't, didn't follow completely from the conversation, but I want to mention it because it's, uh, it's stirring in my cerebrum. Um, you can't imagine the cutbacks in financial aid that are occurring around the world from the wealthy nations. The Dutch, the Norwegians, the UK, even the Swedes, are beginning to cut back their contributions. Two days ago, the Danish parliament reduced its foreign aid program by $400 million. The consequences on the ground, at the grassroots, are unbelievably painful because they just don't have the money to survive. And the cuts are ferocious and arbitrary and unexpected. There is, in South Africa, a group called the Treatment Action Campaign, which I know Alan will agree has been the dominant group on the continent fighting for, for HIV and AIDS to be dealt with appropriately. And they showed enormous courage in South Africa against a government that was in denial and refusing to roll out treatment. 
And they've now got three million people in treatment in South Africa and three million more who need treatment. This is a country which has the highest number of people living with the virus in the world. And it's a tremendous struggle. TAC, the Treatment Action Campaign, is on the verge of going under because of arbitrary and senseless cuts to their basic work, which is really heroic and intelligent. So I, I, I wanted everybody here to know that we are in an ongoing battle to keep the sources of funding in the world focused on the people who need the finances until they can transition into their own economic wherewithal to do what has to be done. And if the Canadian government can be persuaded to fill some of the gap, it would be a magnificent thing for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to do. Thank you again for the evening.